So we're going to start out this week finishing up chapter three. And then next week you'll have your first exam and we'll start on chapter four. So last week we talked a little bit about non-membranous organelles, those that are continuous with the cytosol of the cell. This week we're going to be talking about membranous organelles that do have a distinction from the cytosol. First is the endoplasmic reticulum. It is continuous with the nuclear envelope, so therefore it has direct contact with the nucleus. The endoplasmic reticulum forms cisternae, which are these hollow tubes and chambers. The endoplasmic reticulum can be split up into the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Often abbreviated SMOOTH-ER or SER and rough ER or RER. Functions include synthesis, because certain regions of this endoplasmic reticulum make proteins, carbs, and lipids. It can store synthesized molecules. It can transport materials that travel around the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's responsible for some detoxification. It can absorb drugs and toxins and neutralize them with specific enzymes. The smooth ER is largely responsible for the synthesis of lipids, fatty acids, carbs, sequestering calcium ions, and also for the detox of those drugs and toxins that we just talked about. So its functions are then listed below, synthesis of phospholipids and cholesterol, a steroid hormones, tags or triglycerides, glycogen, and detoxification and inactivation of drugs. Now the smooth ER is called the smooth ER because it is not studded with ribosomes as the rough ER is. So it has it's smooth in appearance in comparison with the rough ER which is studded with these ribosomes. The rough ER is known as the workshop or shipping warehouse of the cell. The fixed ribosomes that are attached to the rough ER are synthesized proteins. And then the transport vesicles carry these proteins to the Golgi apparatus where they can be tagged and shipped out to various places within the cell or extracellularly. The Golgi apparatus is usually called the post office of the cell. It is responsible for modifying and packaging different things that are made throughout the the cell by different organelles. It can add or remove carbs to or from proteins, renews or modifies plasma membrane, and packages special enzymes within vesicles. So because it is responsible for a lot of the packaging and tagging of these proteins and secretions, that's why it's generally called the post office of the cell. Lysosomes are produced at the Golgi apparatus. They are vesicles that break down and recycle large organic molecules. They remove damaged organelles and bacteria. And they are also res responsible for the reduction in muscle size due to aging. So when organelles become damaged or proteins become damaged, the cell undergoes autolysis via lysosomes where they clean up the inside of the cell. Primary lysosomes contain inactive enzymes. Upon fusion with this damaged organelle or protein, those enzymes will become activated and those lysosomes are then known as secondary lysosomes. Peroxisomes are produced by other peroxisomes, so it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. If peroxisomes are made by other peroxisomes, how were peroxisomes made in the first place? They absorb and break down fatty acids and organic compounds. They generate hydrogen peroxide through the breakdown of these materials, which is known as a free radical.
The most abundant enzymes in peroxisomes is catalase, and that helps to break down free radicals and protect the cell from damage. So in a way, they are much like these lysosomes, but they are very specialized in what they break down. Let's take a moment to talk about free radicals. Free radicals are these highly reactive atoms or molecules that contain an unpaired electron. So remember, if there's a valence shell in an atom that is not completely filled, that'll be a very reactive atom. So because these atoms have a an unpaired electron, they are very reactive. They can damage proteins, DNA, and lipids. And when they damage proteins, they can prevent them from reaching their quaternary structure. If a protein doesn't reach its final structure, whether that be primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, depending on the protein, if it does not reach that structure, then it cannot perform its usual function. The damage caused by free radicals is called oxidative damage, and it has a lot of implication, implications with Alzheimer's disease, some other chronic diseases associated with age, and just aging in general. Mitochondria have a double membrane. The inner membrane is composed of cristae, or these foldings. Mitochondria is the site where a lot of the energy is produced in the cell. It's generally known as our powerhouse. It produces energy in the form of ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, and it does so via phosphorylation. So taking adenosine diphosphate, adding a phosphate group to make adenosine triphosphate, and the breakdown of that bond is what releases ATP as energy. The amount of mitochondria per cell is going to vary with energy demands. There are certain cells that don't have a lot of mitochondria or don't have any, like red blood cells. Whereas heart muscle, skeletal muscle are very high in mitochondria because they need a lot of energy to perform their functions. One special thing about mitochondria is that they contain their own DNA, mitochondrial DNA, usually abbreviated mtDNA. It's passed on maternally, and there are some diseases that are implicated with specifically your mitochondrial DNA and mutations in it. So since mitochondria do a lot of your energy generation, let's take a second to talk a little bit about those processes. We're not going to go in extreme depth. If you go on to take chemistry classes, you'll for sure talk about them then, especially if it's biochemistry. Glycolysis is going to take place in the cytosol of the cell. Glycolysis is the first step in this energy generation. It's taking glucose that you take in through food, and it's the beginning of the process to turn that into ATP. So glucose generates some molecules known as pyruvate, and those pyruvate molecules are going to enter the citric acid cycle. It's also known as the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, and that happens in the mitochondrial matrix. The products from the citric acid cycle then enter the electron transport chain, which is our site of aerobic respiration. So before that, it was it did not need oxygen in order to perform those duties, but through electron the electron transport chain requires oxygen. The electron transport chain is the end site of this energy generation pathway. So it goes from glycolysis to the citric acid, citric acid cycle to the electron transport chain. And the electron transport chain is going to generate 95% of the ATP needed to keep the cell alive. So it needs to be the end of the cycle in order to actually generate the ATP that we're spending all this energy to make. Okay, so on to the nucleus. The nucleus is known as the control center of the cell. Without this nucleus, the cell cannot repair itself. The cell needs the genes and the genetic code in order to tell itself how to repair itself. So without the nucleus, it cannot do so because the nucleus stores the genetic information. 
Most cells only contain one nucleus. Mature red blood cells have no nucleus. The nucleus is surrounded by a nuclear envelope. It has nuclear pores, although the nuclear pores are too small to allow DNA to go through. RNA can travel through there, and that's how proteins end up being made, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. The nuclear envelope, like I said, is this double membrane. It has these nuclear pores to allow for chemical communication. It's too small for DNA to pass through freely, but RNA can. The nucleus has quite a bit, quite a few components to it. The nucleoplasm or karyolymph is the cytoplasm of the nucleus. It's the liquid portion. It also contains a nuclear matrix, which is our structural framework of the nucleus. There are also these dark staining components known as nucleoli, not to be confused with the nucleus or nuclei, and they're responsible for synthesizing our RNA and assembling ribosomal subunits. So this is how ribosomes are made. Histones are small proteins within the nucleoli. Nucleosomes are, a complex, are complexes of DNA strands and histones. And when those, when nucleosomes are loosely coiled together, they're known as chromatin. When they're tightly bundled together, right before cell division, they're known as chromosomes. Each will have 23 pairs of chromosomes, one of each pair coming from each parent. Within the nucleus is the genetic code, which is the chemical language that the cell uses in order to communicate, in order to make proteins and repair other structures. It's known as a triplet code because there are three nitrogenous bases that are used to signify a specific amino acid that will then be used to create a gene. So a gene is specifies the amino acids needed to produce specific proteins and that will differ depending on the protein as well. So in order to make proteins, we need to undergo transcription and translation in that order. Transcription is taking the DNA and transforming it into mRNA. Translation is taking that mRNA and then using tRNA to transform that into amino acids in order to make a protein. Transcription is regulated by gene activation, so turning genes on and off. Your book goes into a lot more depth about that. So like I said, transcription is DNA to mRNA. Because DNA is too large to leave the nucleus due to those nuclear pores, we need mRNA to come in and transcribe that DNA into mRNA. There are complementary DNA strands, and they line up with an mRNA strand with complementary base pairings. I uploaded a video for this week about how to do complementary base pairing for transcription and translation. I highly recommend you look at it, especially before you do your homework for this week. So let's talk about the steps of transcription. First, the DNA strands are separated histones are removed, and an enzyme known as RNA polymerase binds to the promoter of the gene to start the process. RNA polymerase then promotes nitrogenous base binding via hydrogen bonds. And then the enzyme and mRNA detach, and translation begins. But not before RNA is processed. So before leaving the nucleus, mRNA has to be edited to take out all of these introns. Introns have to be spliced out. Think of them kind of like mistakes. They need to be kind of proofread before submitted to the next step to making the proteins. So we want to keep the exons, splice out, or get rid of those introns. When introns are not correctly spliced out, they can lead to different genetic diseases, 
or mutations that could lead to cancers. So next is translation, forming a linear chain of amino acids from that mRNA that we created from that DNA strand. The amino acids are provided by tRNA. In this process, an anticodon binds with a complementary mRNA codon. So this is just the process of taking mRNA and turning it into amino acids in order to make a protein. There's a really nice picture in your book about this as well. The nucleus can activate or deactivate certain genes. So if you have a predisposition for certain diseases and there needs to be some sort of environmental trigger and, or traumatic trigger in order to start that process, those genes would be turned off until that environmental trigger cause those genes to be turned on by the nucleus. And that can happen through these chemical signaling pathways as nuclear pores are used for chemical communication within the cell. Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about the plasma membrane and how things move in and out of the plasma membrane for the next few slides. So. There needs to be some degree of membrane permeability for our cells so that nutrients can enter and waste can be removed. If cells were completely impermeable, nothing would be able to enter or leave. If, they were, if the membranes were freely permeable, then anything could enter and leave, and that would be almost as bad as it being impermeable. So we need to have a selectively permeable membrane to allow certain things in, certain things out, keep out the toxins and the viruses and bacteria that we don't want in our cells. There are different ways to do this, and it's generally broken into passive and active transport. Passive does not require any energy in order to complete. Active does. So we're going to talk about the passive processes first. Diffusion is a passive process. It's going to go from a high to low concentration along a concentration gradient. The high to low concentration is talking about the amount of solutes on either side of the plasma membrane. So if a solute is polar and is able to freely cross the membrane without needing a carrier or a channel in order to get through, and there's a lot of that solute on the outside of the membrane and not a lot inside, it's going to want to cross that membrane in order to allow for that equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium between the intracellular and extracellular environments. Some factors that might influence diffusion rates, a shorter distance to travel will make for faster diffusion, Smaller ions and molecules will allow for faster diffusion. Higher temperatures will allow for faster diffusion. A steeper concentration gradient, like the higher the solutes on the outside, the lower the solutes on the inside, that will allow for faster diffusion. And for electrical forces, if there are attractive electrical forces on the other side of the plasma membrane, that will allow for faster diffusion as well. So water and dissolved solvents pass freely. Ions can either pass through lipid port, the lipid portion of our phospholipid bilayer via simple diffusion or through a channel. It really depends on the ion. Alcohol, fatty acids, steroids, lipid-soluble drugs, dissolved gas, and water diffuse freely across the membrane. So those will all depend on how much of that salt solute is outside the membrane versus inside the membrane. Channel mediated diffusion is similar, still does not require energy. Certain ions and water soluble compounds will require channels. Leak channels are open all the time and they allow these ions and water soluble compounds to just pass through the channels freely. 
The rate of diffusion can be limited by the availability of the channels. That makes perfect sense if you think about it like any other form of transportation. For example, like a city bus. If there weren't a, enough city buses to transport all the passengers that needed to be transported, there's really nothing you can do about that, right? You just have to wait for another bus. So these ions have to wait for their turn to be able to pass through these channels for them to be able to diffuse and the rate of diffusion to be what it needs to be. Osmosis is the net diffusion of water across the membrane. So I want you to look at this closely because this is often a point of confusion. The higher the solute concentration, the lower the wa water concentration. Water wants to move toward the higher solute concentration because it wants to move in the direction where there's less water. The water wants to be able to balance out. So if there's a lot of solutes on one side, even though they're dissolved in the water, they're displacing that water molecule in place of its own ion or molecule. So water wants to flow toward the higher solute concentration. You can think of it kind of like it wants the solute concentrations to be equal on both sides so that one side is more not more dilute than the other. So the force that water moves into solution as a result of that solute concentration is known as osmotic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is a pressure that opposes osmotic pressure and pre presses against the water. Aquaporins are these water channels that allow for these, this passage of water through the membrane. Osmolarity is the total solute concentration in a solution. The tonicity is the, are the effects of osmotic solutions in cells. So it'll make more sense when we get into these examples. So let's talk about the first one, isotonic solutions. So we're still talking about osmosis and osmotic flow. So in isotonic solutions, no osmotic flow is taking place. That's because the solute concentration on the inside of the cell and on the outside of the cell is the same. So water doesn't want to move in either direction. It wants to stay where it is to maintain that equilibrium. So all of these examples are going to be based upon a red blood cell so we could see what these solutions, what the effects of these solutions would have on our bodies. So in the case of isotonic solutions, our red blood cells would remain normal. There's no net movement of water through, through the membrane, although it is continuously moving. So there's not, be careful in saying that there's no water movement. There's always water movement. There's just no net movement. There's not more on either side. In a hypotonic solution, water is in a higher concentration outside of the cell. So that means that there is more solute concentration on the inside of the cell. And the water is going to want to flow toward the direction of more solutes. So water would flow into the red blood cell in this case, causing lysis, or in the case of red blood cells, hemolysis. Lysis means to burst. Hemo means blood. So to burst a red blood cell because there's too much water in the cell. That's due to too many solutes inside the cell. The opposite of that would be a hypertonic solution, where there are a lot of solutes outside the cell and a high concentration of water inside the cell. The water will want to rush outside of the cell, causing crenation or shriveling up. Okay. So we're still doing passive transport processes. In carrier-mediated carrier -mediated transport, integral proteins will bind specific ions and carry them across the membrane, kind of like a buddy. In symport or co-transport, two different molecules or ions are going to be traveling in the same direction. In antiport or counter-transport, 
two different molecules or ions are going to be passing in opposite directions. Each carrier protein will bind to certain substances. They do have saturation limits, the same thing like the channels. Their availability is going to limit the transportation rates. So if there's not a lot of carriers, there's not going to be a lot of transport. And they also tend to be regulated on co by cofactors and hormones. Facilitated diffusion is another example of a passive process. It is the passive transport of large molecules or nonpolar molecules. In order for facilitated, diffu facilitated diffusion to take place, the molecule has to bind to a receptor site. That receptor site will then change shape to allow that molecule to enter. There's some implications with this with insulin as one of the transporters is a glucose transporter, and it only functions when it's stimulated by insulin. So insulin tells that glucose transporter when glucose can be transported across the cell. Otherwise, it would be free-floating in the bloodstream. So in diabetes mellitus, or DM, insulin is not as responsive to these glucose transporters. So it doesn't tell those glucose transporters when they should be working, and therefore that glucose kind of stays in the blood and allows for these high levels of blood sugar. And that is diabetes. So that was all passive transport processes. We're gonna move into active transport. So all of the pass passive transport processes did not involve energy. Active transport does. <clears throat> so a high energy bond is going to provide that energy needed to move ions or molecules across the membrane. So we're going to use ATP. The good news is it does not depend on a concentration gradient. So if your body needs it, it won't depend on the solutes. It will depend on using energy to pump that ion or molecule across the membrane. Ion pumps transport ions, as it sounds, and if it's an anti-porter system, it's then known as an exchange pump. If it's bringing in one ion and taking out one ion, that would be an exchange pump. There are two different types of active transport, primary and secondary, broadly. broadly. Primary active transport is going to pump solutes against a concentration gradient using ATP. So exactly what we think of. One example that is very commonly used is the sodium potassium pump. It's sometimes called the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Same thing. It's going to exchange intracellular sodium for extracellular potassium. So it's an exchange pump or an antiporter system. Secondary active transport does not actually require energy from ATP. It's actually going to harness energy from another active transport process that's already using ATP. So it's kind of along for the ride. <clears throat> Vesicular transport is another type of active transport. It's going to tra traffic material into and out of the cell via vesicles. And the two different types of this are endocytosis and exocytosis. Endocytosis, so think endo is within, cyto is cell. So it's going to bring in material into the cell. There's three different types of endocytosis, and those are receptor-mediated endocytosis, pinocytosis, and phagocytosis. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is going to produce these vesicles that have a specific molecule in high concentrations. And the receptors and ligands migrate to these clathrin coated pits, which are kind of sticky. They could also go into what's called caviole, which just means tiny caves. It's very similar. <clears throat> 
Pinocytosis means cell drinking, so it's an endocyto it's endocytosis that involves taking in large amounts of fluid. Phagocytosis is cell eating, so it's a form of endocytosis taking in the large amounts of the solid. Some structures have pseudopods or pseudopodia, and those are cytoplasmic extensions. They surround objects and digest the contents. Some other cells that do these are phagocytes or macrophages. Those are specific types of white blood cells that engulf foreign objects, usually bacteria viruses. And then exocytosis is going to be the opposite of endocytosis. Exo means out, cytose cell. So a vesicle is going to fuse with the plasma membrane and eject materials out into the extracellular environment. Transcytosis, trans means across, cyto means cell. So it's going to produce vesicles on one side of the cell and discharge them via exocytosis on the other side of the cell. It's very common in capillaries. Membrane potential. So there's a chain there's a charge difference in the plasma membrane due to cations and anions on either side of the plasma membrane. It has nothing to do with the cytosol itself or any of the organelles, specifically the plasma membrane. When there's a difference between these charges and they're being kept apart, that's called a potential difference. And because this is within a plasma membrane, it's called the membrane potential. And when that plasma membrane is at rest, that's known as the resting membrane potential. That will come into play later on when we talk more about um, the nervous system and nervous system impulses that will harness that resting membrane potential for electrical energy. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the cell cycle as well. So at maturity, your body has about 75 trillion cells. That's an absolutely insane number. It has to keep up a relative amount of those cells via cell division. If you ever have any damage to cells, your skin cells replace themselves all the time. Your stomach cells replace themselves all the time. So cell division is constantly going on. Cell division will produce a pair of daughter cells, so they'll be gen genetically identical to the cells that were being divided. If a cell is damaged, it will undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death. So your cells know when they are damaged and when they are no longer performing their function, and they will get rid of themselves through apoptosis. <clears throat> so the first phase of cell division is interphase. It's broken down into G1, S, and G2 phases. G stands for growth. So G1 and G2 are just phases where your cell is taking some time to grow. S phase is where DNA replication takes place. Your somatic cells or your body cells are going to spend most of their lives in interphase, growing and replicating DNA in preparation of the actual mitotic event. In order to replicate their DNA, they need the enzyme DNA polymerase. Next is the M phase. That's going to include mitosis and cytokinesis. And there is a big distinction between mitosis and cytokinesis. Mitosis is when the nuclei divide. So uh, mitosis does not actually create separate cells. Cytokinesis does. The cells have not separated until cytokinesis happens and divides the cytoplasm. So mitosis just creates two nuclei. Cytokinesis separates them into two daughter cells. So that's a very important distinction. Because the nuclei divide, the chromosomes are then duplicated as well. The phases of mitosis can be abbreviated PMAT for prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Cytokinesis starts during mitosis in late anaphase. So here's a picture of all of that happening. This is interphase. The cell is at rest, it's growing. Then we have prophase. 
Sometimes they make the distinction of pro-metaphase. It's kind of an intermediary step between prophase and metaphase. In metaphase, all the genetic material is lined up in the middle for meta, middle. Anaphase, the segments are being pulled toward either pole. Telophase, we have two separate nuclei that are being formed. And at the end of telophase, they will have been formed. And then in cytokinesis, when that is finished, these cells will split into two. Mm. The mitotic rate is dependent, is how often the cell is going to undergo mitosis. The longer the life expectancy of a cell, the slower the mitotic rate. So there are some cells within your body that are just not going to divide. Um, your nervous system cells, some of your cardiac cells, they just don't divide, and that's why they have a really hard time repairing themselves when they get injured. But there are some cells that don't have a very long life expectancy at all, like those in your stomach lining that have to replace themselves all the time because they're always bathed in hydrochloric acid, or your skin cells that are constantly being sloughed off from abrasion with other surfaces. So the mitotic rate will definitely vary depending on the type of cell we're talking about and what the life expectancy of the cell is. Stem cells are undifferentiated cells. That's what all cells are going to be derived from. In order for cells to be able to divide and replace themselves, they need a substantial amount of energy. So they need you to be as healthy as possible and be taking in as many nutrients and metabolites as possible. So if somebody is undergoing starvation, they have a really hard time replacing these cells in their body because they just don't have the energy to devote toward these mitotic processes. So that will lead to organ failure and eventually death. There's a lot of regulation of the cell cycle. I more so care that you know which different things regulate the cell cycle and not so much the processes on how they do. They are pretty complicated. But there is this factor known as the M phase promoting factor, MPF, also known as maturation promoting factor. It's going to promote mitotic division when it's present that's when mitosis begins. Growth factors will also promote mitotic division. Repressor genes, as it sounds like, will not. They will repress that. Telomeres are at the ends of chromosomes. Every time cell division happens, those telomeres shorten. And there is a point at which they cannot shorten anymore and the cell will just stop dividing. That has a lot of implications on age, because if your cells stop dividing and are unable to replace themselves, a lot of your tissues might become more brittle or unable to sustain the same amount of traumas from things. You, you notice that as people get older, their skin t tends to become less elastic and less... Um, and more brittle and more prone to injury. And they tend to bruise more easily too because their blood vessels aren't as strong as they used to be. And that's because of the aging of these cells and their inability to divide and make new cells as easily as they used to be able to. When we're talking about cell division, we also kind of have to talk about cancer because cancer is uncontrollable cell division. So if cells keep dividing, they tend to divide at a rate that is unsustainable and inefficient for the amount of energy that is used to be able to keep dividing. When cells continue to divide, 
without any kind of regulation, they become tumors. Those are also known as neoplasms. A primary tumor is a tumor that grows in one spot, and it's the spot at which the cell division is uncontrolled. If it's a secondary tumor, then that tumor traveled elsewhere, and that is known as metastasis. So when those cancer cells start to invade other tissues, that is metastasis. They start to travel. It's also known as a secondary tumor. Tumors can be either benign or malignant. Benign means that although it's an abnormal way for those cells to grow, they're not necessarily cancerous or harmful. Malignant is the means that they're a bad type of cancer cell or a bad tumor. That means that they will likely be harmful, have an inefficient use of this energy. If a tumor is known as malignant, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a poor prognosis associated. Some malignant tumors are really easy to get rid of. Some are not, but it really just depends on the tumor and the location. Most tumors will also undergo angiogenesis. So genesis means the creation of. Angio means blood vessel. So it forms its own blood vessels to be able to provide itself with nourishment. It's pretty crazy. So it's going to devote energy to itself in that way as well. Taking blood that should be nourishing healthy tissue and using it to nourish itself. So when mutations happen in these proteins in order to cause cancers, in order for these cells to not stop dividing, those genes then become what's known as oncogenes. Onco means cancer, so they're cancer genes. Mutagens cause mutations in those proteins, which can cause cancer. A lot of mutagens are also carcinogens. They're just cancer-causing agents. There are a lot of chemicals that can cause cancer. So if we look at these normal cells versus cancer cells, cancer cells tend to have these large, variably shaped nuclei. The cells are constantly dividing and disorganized. They vary in size and shape, and they lose all of their normal features. So when you're looking at them through microscopy, it's actually pretty easy to tell when these cells have become cancerous. Cellular differentiation. So how do cells know what their job is going to be? They all start off as these stem cells when we're embryos. And then they start to develop certain characteristics that tell them, I'm going to be a muscle cell or I'm going to be a fat cell. And they will all vary, and they're all different shapes and sizes depending on what their job is going to be. And they all have different organelles depending on what their job is going to be. So these stem cells will produce these specialized cells. They'll all have limited capabilities, but they're, they will be very specialized in what they can do. Like muscle cells are not going to be good at conducting nervous impulses, but nerve cells definitely will be. So when these specialized cells come together, they form tissues. So muscle cells, when they come together, form muscle. Nervous cells come together and form nerves. And we will talk about tissues next week. So let me know if you have any questions regarding this lecture. And we will pick up with tissues next week. Good luck on your test.